uh, the lectures uh, supported by one six association are taking place today it's uh, we have an annual roadmap uh, to present uh, several uh, lecture sessions uh, online and uh, we welcome everybody to join as well as uh, use uh, the recorded material for information uh, today we focus on uh, the 6G network and artificial intelligence uh, with distinguished uh, speakers uh, I make just a short uh, uh, cross through the speakers uh, we have today, and then I will uh, in, uh, I will invite the first speaker to start. So the first uh, lecture uh, is uh, from uh, Slavomir Stansak, who is head of wireless communications and networks Depart department at Fra Fraunhofer. Uh, the, the speeches are, are about the road from 5G to 6G. Then uh, we have uh, David Gespert, uh, the director of Eurocom and professor also in Eurocom Mobile Communications Laboratory. Uh, then uh, we have a speech uh, from Wolfgang Utsik, the professor at Technical University of Munich about the physical air and FTD systems. Uh, the next uh, speaker will be Albert Banks, professor at the Carlos III University of Madrid and deputy director of the India Networks Institute regarding the artificial intelligence for the control and orchestration of uh, mobile uh, networks. And we will conclude with some uh, a session related to uh, questions and uh, answers. So I will... Uh, go back to our first speaker and I would like to invite uh, uh, Slavomir Stansak to start the lecture. Actually, uh, Slavomir uh, has a long uh, uh, experience and know-how uh, in, uh, in, in the area of uh, mobile communication, but also in the area of uh, AI, data analytics and machine learning. And I think uh, we look forward to, to hear uh, this overview a lecture from uh, Slavomir uh, around these topics. So Slavomir, I don't want to take more time. Uh, I give you the floor. I think I think you must be able to, to share your uh, slide sets. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, no, I am not able. You have to stop sharing, I think. <clears throat> so. Okay, let's, yeah. Yeah, can That's you see great. the slides? Yes, yes. We yeah, can and then apparently you can also hear me. So, um, yeah, welcome to my talk and thanks for, for the invitation. Uh, the talk, I just, you know, sorry, I, um, this was a little bit misunderstanding. And uh, today I realized that, you know, the session is about AI. <laughs> so I, I changed a little bit, you know, um, uh, the content of the topic. Originally, I just wanted to talk, to give an overview over the hub. Uh, we have here in Berlin, I mean, here's some uh, basic data regarding the hub. It's like uh, started last year, funded with 7 million euros. And uh, you have, you know, we have like uh, 20 research institutions. And on the right hand side, you can see technical innovation areas. So you see, you know, we are, you know, it's, uh, uh, many, many topics brought uh, from uh, starting with Subterra Heights Mobile Access. Intelligent radio environments. This is related to um, yeah, this smart surfaces, network as a sensor, uh, 6G connectivity, post-quantum security, and autonomous convergent networks. And uh, as I said, I, I am not uh, going to through all these uh, aspects here in this talk. And uh, but uh, just wanted to mention, you know, some kind of uh, yeah, say. Um, key driving factors for, for our research. I mean, first of all, I mean, um, the question is, you know, how to achieve, you know, this 100 gigabit per second, right? So, and then, you know, it's known that you can play with, uh, you know, several par parameters and uh, uh, so you can increase power or reduce range and, uh, or you can increase multiplex Multiplexing gain, which is mainly the focus in sub six gigahertz um, uh, frequency regime, or you can increase bandwidth. And in fact, you have to do it if you want to achieve, you know, this um, uh, uh, this uh, rate. But then, you know, you go to higher frequencies. But then, you know, uh, you you 
just encounter other problems, you know, like higher noise and path loss. And uh, so it requires more power. And that's why you need, you know, for example, high antenna gain. And then, you know, you have the first challenge, how to ensure high antenna gain with mobility. And also, uh, you know, what happens if you look at the energy efficiency? And in fact, uh, what we, you know, our conclusion is you, if you just, uh, you know, apply the traditional, say, design, then it will lead to disaster in terms of energy efficiency. So, so the question is, you know, or another challenge, how to avoid excessive energy consumption. And here we had uh, some thoughts, but as I said, I mean, just we are starting. I mean, the nice thing about the hub, we are quite interdisciplinary, you know, uh, including hardware guys. They, they don't know so much about mobile communications, but we also have, you know, uh, basement processing people and networking people and so on. And uh, definitely, you know, in order to, uh, you know, achieve a significant performance gains in terms of energy efficiency, you know, you cannot focus on individual component. Yeah, you need to, you know, uh, try or, or achieve synergetic gains. You know, enabled by cross uh, domain analysis. And here, you can see, you know, some uh, some uh, ideas we have. I mean, maybe I pick uh, one that is this digital analog trade-off. So one special case is hybrid beamforming, but what we call this analog to information. So which lead, you know, in the end, which is supposed to lead to, to new, you know, hardware architectures. So also I would like to point out that, you know, um, mobile networks are, will be virtualized and we have this virtualization and cloudification. And then of course, you know, implement uh, lower layer, layers uh, uh, run functions in software. Né? It's uh, it's really challenging, and in fact, you know, um, if you try to do it uh, uh, for DU, where you have you know this, uh, for example, high uh, beam forming functions, uh, high layer functions, high file layer functions, then uh, um, it turns out that you know 90, 95 uh, five percent of the processing you know uh, requirements. Of the whole BBU, you know, um, uh, are needed here for processing, you know, in the U. And uh, this is also a challenge, especially, you know, if you uh, would like, if you want to uh, decrease the energy uh, consumption. And this is something we are also um, uh, addressing. And then, you know, next week there will be a, the demo in in Dresden. So just you are invited to visit us at uh, you know at this I I 5G plus plus summit in Dresden. So anyway, I mean, just the conclusion is, uh, I think that, you know, uh, the focus was, you know, uh, in the previous uh, generations, you know, on spectral efficiency, but I think that if you go to high frequencies, then, you know, uh, and then have a lot of bandwidth, uh, then the focus shouldn't be only, you know, on spectral efficiency, but we, we need to take care of energy consumption. So this is, I think, not new what I am saying here, but I just would like to emphasize that's why you see, you know, have to some extension of uh, design dimensions to include energy consumption, uh, you know, in addition to, you know, for example, spectral efficiency or, or uh, resource efficiency, spectrum usage and things like this. Of course, data acquisition, I mean, we are talking here about AI, so we need to capture data, but also network computing. I think, I mean, when I was a young PhD, I learned, a student, I learned that, you know, Communications is expensive, computation is cheap. And I think that this is still true. You know, moving beats over, uh, from one point to another point is, is expensive in terms of energy efficiency. That's why you should try to do things locally. Good, I mean, when compared to, um, to um, uh, I mean, the question is what is 6G? You know, the, the session is about 6G. So, um, and uh, when, you know, looking, you know, at this uh, history of, of past uh, generations, so I think that, you know, you could summarize, okay, 6G at the moment, what I, I can see, you know, if I would have to summarize this in two words, it will be intelligence, that's why I mean AI, with, in, you know, different aspects plus uh, sensing. So this is, you know, definitely, um, these are two, um, say, um, crucial features of 6G, but intelligence, I mean, 5G networks are also, in some sense, intelligent. The, the topic of AI or machine learning is not new, but I think that here we are talking about this, um, yeah, deeply integrated AI 
uh, because just so you know, as I mentioned on the previous slide, um, you know, net, uh, network computing. So here, I mean, one example, because I, I said, okay, 6G will be about uh, sensing here. This is just, you see the change of my slides. And uh, okay, so for example, machine learning can be used, you know, for sensing. And here, you know, you can see the, the simple idea of uh, time reversal that if you have a rich uh, multipath environment, so you could, for example, use this uh, knowledge um, and, and uh, also you can use machine learning tools to detect changes in, 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 in the yeah, propagation environment to detect passive objects. And, um, and this is illustrated here. So there are some, some um, 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 challenges, of course. I mean, large bandwidth means high time resolution. You can also use massive MIMO to get high angular resolution, but maybe there are some potential conflicts requirements of communication and sensing. So, and uh, another challenge is that wireless channel and its statistics are constantly changing. And here, I mean, I argue in favor of, you know, using our domain knowledge and learn some kind of invariant features extracted from channels and context information as input to ML tools. I have probably this well-known uh, example is, uh, for example, to use a channel covariance matrix for uh, localization or other sensing tasks. And uh, here you can see, you know, one um, reference. Uh, the advantage is uh, are approximately constant over milliseconds to seconds. So, it, you know, the statistics do not change so fast as, uh, you know, the channel. And uh, also in, in the context of OFDM system, there are some um, uh, advantages, but still this uh, channel covariance matrix is sensitive to changes in the frequency, transmit pre-colors, antenna array. So I think that, you know, we have to learn if we apply machine learning tools we use, we have to learn features that are more stable or, or constant, you know, with respect to this, say, uh, system parameters. So one idea is this angular power spectrum we uh, have, yeah, have a lot of uh, papers on this. And the, in particular, uh, you can use, you know, APS-based uh, schemes for, for localization. So the idea is that if you have you know, this um, uh, power distribution over the angle, you can, uh, under certain conditions and using, you know, some um, additional information, some other, uh, other source, uh, data sources, to, um, you know, to do localization or other sensing tasks. And here it's, uh, for example, you could combine, you know, this APS information from different base stations, but you could also uh, include, you know, some range uh, information. And then if you combine uh, 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 these sources in some systematic ways, then you can just, you know, um, improve uh, uh, localization results. And then, you know, um, here, I mean, we are not applying, you know, uh, deep neural networks or something like this. Um, uh, we apply, you know, traditional machine learning or data-driven um, uh, algorithms because they provide some kind of natural inter interface to include you, uh, this uh, additional um, uh, information. Good, so, uh, but what will be the impact of emerging 6G technologies on the network management and operations? So I said, I am more, you know, phi layer guy and Mac layer, phi uh, layer guy. And then, but still we have some people here in the hub, you know, um, dealing with some um, networking aspects. And of course, I mean, uh, we are developing, you know, uh, technologies, uh, 6G technologies, including, you know, sub terahertz, intelligent reflecting surfaces, uh, integrated communication sensing, you know, the semantic enhanced and goal-oriented communication and file uh, layer of post-quantum security. So, uh, you know, um, incorporated, including all this technology in 6G will have some, you know, impact on the network management operation. So of course, I mean, we don't have time here to, to talk about this. I would like to emphasize that this is just, you know, some like key question here in, in our hub. So of course, I mean, one um, important question is, you know, how to ensure sub terahertz connectivity and the mobility. Sub terahertz, I mean, for me, it's, uh, you know, the frequency range between 100 gigahertz and 300 gigahertz. So it's um, definitely, you know, um, not an easy task. And uh, 
And of course, I mean, AI uh, will play here definitely a crucial role. And I think that this is, there is some kind of uh, consensus about this. But there are some um, challenges. You know, uh, we are dealing with large disaggregated networks, especially if we talk, you know, about sellers' uh, network design. So disaggregated network means disaggregated data, right? The data uh, are not, you know, at a single point. And maybe they, these points are connected via wireless or, uh, uh, you know, capacity constraint uh, uh, or, you know, limited, capacity limited links. So that's why we have to avoid large data control transport and so on. This means, you know, the trend will go towards, you know, distributed uh, AI, distributed machine learning. And I think that we have to predict local changes in the network. As a prediction, will play a crucial role. So I think that also there is, uh, you know, some kind of consensus about this. And then we will also have, you know, two kinds of algorithms, you know, like fast algorithms that need to cope with highly dynamic environments. This is what I was talking about in, in the context of APS, angular power spectrum. But of course, I mean, in the network management, you know, we will uh, have access to a huge amount of data and probably we can apply also deep AI with global view to do, um, you know, um, machine learning on larger time scales. So here only just, you know, um, um, this, you know, reactive versus proactive mobile networks. So I think today mobile networks are mostly reactive. So detect the problem, outage, poor performance, and respond to the problem by taking appropriate action. So I think in many domains, especially, you know, if you go to campus networks like industrial communication, future networks must be proactive, anticipate a problem, robust prediction required, and that requires robust prediction and act proactively to avoid the problem. So, and then, for example, you could use intelligent reflecting surfaces or other mechanisms, you know, to, to do something, you know, to ensure, you know, the desired performance. Here we have this, you know, AI for mobile projects running at BMBF, where we just dealing with this problem in the context of uh, V2X communication. And um, yeah, so, and uh, the goal is, you know, to, to develop robust end-to-end -end, end -end prediction of QS parameters. This is just, as I said, I mean, the fundament for, for this proactive resource allocation. And here there is a simple, you know, use case, probably no to everybody. Uh, you have, you know, uh, say autonomous cars or something like this. They just need, you know, um, connectivity, robust connectivity. But of course, I mean, we are dealing with a uh, wireless, uh, wireless environment. We have interference. We have to, uh, fading effects. And you see these red spots. They should indicate, you know, some uh, problems, you know, like coverage holes or strong intercell interference. And then, you know, we need to um, predict such spots and then, you know, um, um, and then do something, you know, to ensure the desired link, uh, uh, link quality. This is not an easy task, I have to say, especially, you know, because you have interference and then in order to get, you know, robust prediction, you have to, you have to learn, you have to take into account the interference. That's why this is really a challenging problem. Anyway, so what I am just, uh, I argue in favor of, you know, especially of some methods that take into account, you know, domain knowledge. I think that this is extremely important. And here there is a paper where we just, you know, develop a robust cell load learning. Load is related to interference by taking into account, you know, um, certain properties of the interference functions. So, and the green line is just, you know, the performance of our algorithm. And then here, uh, you know, the main message I would like to convey is that it provides good results all, also for a small amount of data, which is extremely important in highly dynamic wireless environment because the distribution changes over time, uh, all the time. So, and also here you can see, you know, the the performance loss if you don't take into account prior, prior knowledge. Here in this case, we know that, for example, functions are Lipschitz continuous and monotonic in some sense. And then this can be exploited, you know, to uh, in this robust prediction. And then, you know, you can really achieve significant performance gains. 
Okay, so uh, here we are performing a lot of uh, uh, measurement campaigns in this project. So you have here a list. I, I hope that, you know, some of this uh, data can be provided to the community. But uh, at the moment, just we use this for, uh, for our research here, just, you know, it's a measurement campaign on the highway. Um, uh, uh, we performed, you know, within this uh, uh, project. And uh, here, what we learned from these measurements, you can see here on this uh, slide. So, and, and the main message is that, you know, you shouldn't try <laughs> to predict uh, the channel. Né? So you have to, you know, um, say, address a simple problem, which is, you know, um, a prediction of the distribution. So that's why, you know, because here this uh, figure uh, illustrates that, you know, the distribution, you know, um, stay stable over some some uh, distance or between two cars or, or over some times. Né? And this leads, you know, to something what we call this CDI maps, uh, channel distribution, uh, uh, channel distribution information maps. This is more or less, I mean, of course, this is heuristics, but it says that, you know, within a certain region, the, the channel distribution remains the same and then, you know, changes to another distribution, right? And, um, and this can be used, you know, for this pre, uh, proactive resource allocation. Here, um, we had, you know, uh, my student is at BMW and they are interested, you know, in this uh, coexistence of services. So you have, you know, some kind of best effort traffic and delay constraint services. And then, you know, here you can see, you know, what you can achieve if you take into account this, you know, um, um, into account this prediction of, of, of channel statistics. Now here on the right hand or left hand side, you can see, you know, uh, the shift of, uh, of this uh, PDF of the SINR to the right. And here, just on the right hand side, you can see, you know, CDF as a function of delay for this, you know, delay constraint service. And then just, you know, you can see that there is a huge potential for performance gains if you uh, uh, just take this, um, uh, this information into account. For this, of course, you need, you know, robust predictions and uh, as I said, this is just, you know, highly challenging um, um, uh, task. And, and for this, we need, you know, to develop a robust machine learning or AI algorithms. That's it. Thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed the talk. Thank you, Slavomir. And uh, I would like, uh, 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 by concluding your speech, to, to mention again that uh, you are a member uh, since February uh, 2018 uh, of uh, the ITUT focus group on machine learning for future networks, uh, including 5G. So the, your talk uh, is, is very important. And uh, since I want to uh, to uh, say thanks to our participants. Uh, we have more than 150 participants at the moment uh, joining our lectures. Uh, I would like to ask them to, for any questions to use the chat uh, so that we can have an, an interesting question and uh, answer session at the end of, this, uh, of, the, of, the, of the speeches. So I would like uh, now to uh, ask uh, David Gesper to, to take the floor. Uh, Professor David Gesper is currently serving as the director of uh, Uricom. Uh, he's the, also an IEEP fellow and uh, he was awarded in 2020 uh, funding by the French Interdisciplinary Institute on Artificial Intelligence for a chair in the area of uh, AI and the future of IoT. And in 2021, he also received the Grand Prix in research from IMT French Academy of Science. So we are looking forward to, to David's uh, speech as well, uh, to David's presentation. And uh, also I remind everybody to send their questions in the chat. Thank you. Hi, Nancy, thank you very much. Uh, should I, is it ready now to share my screen? You can share your screen, David, yeah. Okay, uh, hold on a second, because on the screen sharing options, I don't see the PowerPoint, so let me try again. Ah. 
sometimes it requires to, to share your whole screen. That's a problem. <laughs> Um, I guess you don't see the presentation. Do you hear? What do you see? No, we see only only the folders. Yeah, exactly. So the folder list. Not working so let me see uh okay let me try to share how do i share the whole screen okay i click on this one yeah yes i think uh and then this one yes how about now yeah that's that's fine okay now i go i go to presentation mode yeah and then one more step how's it going now uh perfect okay Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you. Uh, very pleased to be uh, here today and to be giving this presentation uh, after Slavomir's uh, very interesting presentation. Um, so this talk is about uh, a slightly different topic. So that there is an AI component in it, but the application of AI here is quite different. Uh, I'm interested in sensing as uh, you know, one of the KPIs of 6G networks is going to be the ability to do uh, very accurate sensing, in particular, a very accurate uh, localization. And I'm interested to see if we can improve the uh, performance of sensing and localization with the following idea, which is to inject uh, in the wireless network a robot, uh, a single robot, uh, whose function is entirely dedicated to the sensing purposes and who is going to act um, as much as possible intelligently for the network for sensing purposes. So what do I mean by this? I will explain in a minute. This is uh, the outline of the presentation. I will, I will uh, clarify a little bit this, again, this scenario. And I will uh, point out the, the first challenge when we want to do something like that is uh, to be able to understand and predict uh, the, the channel, the, the radio channel between the robot and the, and the ground UEs that we want to localize. And uh, in this particular talk, so th there are many ways you can use a robot to, to localize ground UEs, uh, depending on the sensing capabilities that the, the robot have. But for example, if a first level of capability is just to be able to measure our society levels. And based on that, the question is, can we localize uh, ground nodes? With a regular network that is not augmented with a robot, uh, the community, I think, agrees that the answer is no. You, you cannot use RSSI alone because RSSI is typically a very noisy uh, measure. It somehow relates to the position of devices, but it does that in a loose manner that's very noisy and it's very hard to, to accurately localize nodes just based on RSSI information. The question is, can you do it if you inject a robot in the network? And the answer is yes, and this is, this is going to be the topic of this talk. Uh, I will also explain in a, in a, as part of the talk uh, how you can make the robot uh, more intelligent by not just exploiting the data that you collect with the robot, but also trying to proactively uh, steer the robot in places where the measurements that the robot is collecting is as useful as possible for the task. Okay, so how do I explain all of that. So this is, first of all, the scenario I'm talking about here. Uh, I have a wireless network. It's typically a, a cellular network. And I want to inject a robot in the scenario for sensing purposes. Sensing can mean, in my case, um, to reconstruct the environment, like the, the position of uh, reflecting structures, buildings, uh, essentially building a 3D map of the, the environment. This is one type of task. Another one is uh, directly trying to find accurate location of nodes on the ground. And I will be uh, mainly spending time on the, on the second, second scenario here. I, we have papers on the first one for people who are interested. So why is it possibly a good idea to inject a robot in a wireless network for, for sensing or localization purposes? Well, my point is that there are two ways, two reasons why you want to do that. First is that you can enrich 
uh, the data space that you're getting with the robot because the robot is collecting additional measurements, obviously. The second point is that you can move freely the, the robot, you know, if it's a car in 2D or if it's a, a UAV uh, in 3D. And by that, you can, you can in fact, co construct meaningful data, additional data that are useful for your, for your sensing purposes. So those are the, the really two big reasons why you want to do that. So the first challenge is uh, in order to uh, make, uh, make sense of the measurements, the radio measurements that are acquired by the robot and sort of relate that to the, uh, the, the sensing results you want to reconstruct or the, or, the, or the localization you want to achieve. You need to be able to make sense of the child measurements uh, by way of, of a good channel model. So here, I'm, I'm not interested in trying to predict or, or extract some sense out of fast fading. It's very difficult to do that. So I'm just going to limit myself to exploiting uh, path loss measurements. So a path loss model is, a, you know, the one that we are studying, that we are looking at here is very standard. Uh, the path loss is basically driven by a path loss exponent that affects how distance uh, um, affects the uh, power decay. There might be uh, some, some offset parameters, beta, and then some additional shadowing parameters. But the main important point of that slide here is that uh, the way path loss behaves with distance is entirely different whether you are looking at a line of sight or no line of sight situation. So it's very, very important to be able to distinguish those two cases. And one of the reasons why RSSI has not been a successful tool for localization up to now has been that while it is fairly easy to localize targets, if you know you are in pure line of sight environment where the child model is, is fairly simple to use and, and to exploit. Uh, if you're in non-line of sight environment, the, the way um, position of the devices and, and, and receive power level depend on each other becomes much more complicated, obviously, because it depends on the whole environment and buildings and so on. So it's extremely important to be able to, to distinguish those, those two cases. You could even have more than two cases. You may have you know, severe non-line of sight or, or lightly obstructed line of sight. But for the sake of this presentation, I will assume that this parameter S can only uh, designate either a line of sight case or non-line of sight. So S can be either zero or one or one or two. So two, two values. So the first thing that we need to do is to uh, um, build the model um, you know, in order to predict the, uh, the, the path loss. Um, so that they are in the literature, you, you'll find the main way to do that is to use a probabilistic model. So depending on the height of the, of the robot or, or in general, the, the angle and distance described by the, uh, by the radio link, you can predict more or less the, the probability of maintaining a line of sight. So if the angle is close to 90 degrees, then uh, you can use uh, this kind of uh, um, logistic uh, function model uh, where the, the line of sight would be uh, uh, more likely if you, have, if you have an angle closer to 90 degrees and is less likely if the angle is uh, closer to, to zero, closer to a horizontal scale, uh, scale. So this is one way. Another approach is to, is to uh, use maps. So, uh, a map could be a 3D uh, description of the environment. So th these maps are readily available. Uh, and you can use that for a given position of the robot and of the ground node. You can use that to predict if the link is in line of sight or non in line of sight. And you can then run that through the, 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 the proper channel model. And based on that, you can derive what are called radio maps. These are, these are heat maps that represent the amount of power level uh, as a function of where you put the, uh, the, 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 ro the robot in the, in the network. Okay. Now, the, the thing is that initially you, you may or may not, may not have the, the, the map. So you, the first thing that comes to mind is you need to classify all, all the measurements that are uh, collected by the robot, the RSSI measurements, and to decide whether this corresponds to line of sight or non line of sight uh, measurement. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. That's the slide I wanted to show. So, this problem can be either supervised. So, for example, if you do have a, a 3D map available, then it's very easy 
to uh, to check whether the link is a uh, is a uh, line of sight or line of sight, and you can uh, you know uh, derive easy labels. If you don't have the map, you can look at for a given distance. You can look at the attenuation you're observing, and then by by clustering, you can pretty much decide uh, whether the, the link is one that has been experiencing line of sight or non-line of sight. So say, okay, so once you have those two, um, this problem of classification done, then you can actually solve the problem at hand, which is, uh, let's try to imagine how the robot could be helped, or how could be used to localize the, the ground nodes. So there's an optimization problem they need to draw, and it looks like this, so it's, uh, it's a mean square error type of problem, essentially, where you want to find the best match between a set of RSSI measurements that are represented here by, by gammas. And then uh, a number of parameters that, that represent the position of the uh, robot uh, here in V, and U being the position of the users, which you're trying to find. The position of the robot itself could be assumed to be known by, by uh, way of GPS. And then you also need to learn the child model parameters, which we didn't have initially. And you also do not know whether the links are line of sight or line of sight. So this is something you need to learn uh, while flying if, you, if you're dealing with a UAV. So how do you solve this problem? Uh, so the first thing you do is that you, you try to classify. So you run machine learning to classify the links to decide whether they are likely to be line of sight or non line of sight links. And once you have done that, you actually can run an algorithm. This is what we have proposed uh, recently. It's an iterative algorithm, which does two things at the same time. It uh, tries to estimate for a given uh, channel um, set of channel model parameters, it tries to estimate the likely position of the ground nodes. And then for uh, uh, the next likely position of ground nodes, it updates the child model parameters and you iterate back and forth between these two until convergence. Uh, the reason why I use uh, particle filtering here is because this problem is, is highly non-convex and as, uh, is a, uh, well, multi-dimensional. So there can be many, many users to be localized. And we found this to be, uh, to be an efficient approach in terms of implementation. Okay, now we get the picture. But the next part, the, the, the next point in this presentation is, is how, to, how to turn the robot in, in something that is the most meaningful uh, possible, the most informative as possible. So this, this is uh, uh, what I, we call here active learning. So in the context of localization, active learning means what? It means that we're going to try to optimize the, uh, the series of position of the robot in 3D in order to accelerate the localization process and accelerate as well the learning of the child model parameters. How do we do that? Well, we're going to form a metric. In this case, the metric is, is given by the Fisher information matrix uh, that relates to uh, the estimation of the user location and of the child model parameters. We're going to estimate the Fisher information matrix, and then we're going to move in a greedy manner. We're going to move the robot at every step in the direction that maximally increases the, the Fisher information for the next iteration. The intuition behind this approach is that this will create a position of the uh, robots that will collect measurements that are the most informative for what you're trying to estimate. Uh, I'm going to skip uh, some details, but uh, Basically, you, you, this, this problem is turned into, again, an optimization problem, which ideally you, will, you would like to look at like this. You would like to minimize the mean square error uh, for the estimation of all the position of, of all the users, regardless of line of sight, non line of sight cases. And you turn that into another problem where you, you, you try to uh, optimize the Kramer row bound of the uh, corresponding estimation problem. So we use this, uh, this uh, Fisher information matrix, which is given by F here, and we minimize, we minimize the trace function of, of this matrix. Okay, and we have a, a way, a recursive way to update the Fisher information matrix at every step. 
Uh, let me take you through a first result. So this is uh, what this plot shows is that the root mean square error for the localization in meters versus the, the mission flight of the, the robot. So this is in meter, uh, 500 meters up to uh, 1100 meters. So as, as the robot is flying above the, the, the city, uh, you collect more and more measurements. And so it is expected that you will end up uh, localizing the ground rules more and more accurately. Of course, unless those are moving, in which case there is a, a tra tracking issue. But in this, in this particular plot, the, the users are supposed to be static. But what we did is that we compared two approaches, first of all. First, uh, an, an approach that does not um, require the, the 3D map in the first place. So the 3D map is sort of implicitly reconstructed along the way, but this is more difficult to do. So the result is not as good. Uh, while if you start with a, with a 3D map initially, which you have um, you know, obtained as a prior information, then you can get excellent uh, localization performance uh, just with RCSI. I mean, excellent. Of course, it, it, it all depends the kind of uh, targets you have in mind. This is not centimeter localization. This is more like several meters. Uh, the other comparison that we do is that between the, uh, the, the, the for example, the, um, the curve I'm showing here with the mouse, which is the dashed red line and the solid blue line, um, the difference is whether the UAV describes an, an arbitrary trajectory in the sky or whether it's using this idea of active learning. And as you can see, with active learning, you can uh, boost the learning process by going to places that will enrich your data space in such a way you can quickly learn the channel and learn the user position. All right, and this is, I don't know if this is going to work. This is actually a simulation for now uh, that shows uh, basically pretty much the same thing as the previous slide, but in, in a dynamic manner. So as you can see in, in purple, you see the UAV moving and learning how to position itself uh, to localize the user, which is represented by a circle here. And, and the square here was the estimation of the position. So in the single user case, the best thing to do for the, for the robot is actually to fly towards the user. So it ends up flying and hovering above the user as a, as a let's say, byproduct. This is just an observation we, we've made. Uh, now the question is what happens with more users? Well, it turns out that this kind of problem, the more users you have, the better it is. The reason is that the localization of users is, is decoupled from user to user, with the exception of the channel model, which is shared by all the users by construction. And therefore, having more users to localize means that you only get a single set of channel model parameters to estimate. And therefore, you get more and more uh, measurements, and it, tell, it, it will give you a better, better performance for your uh, channel model. Uh, estimation. This is why overall the performance is improving with more users. Okay, so so far we have used a robot. The rob robot has been intelligently uh, moving around in 3D in order to quickly localize users on the ground and at the same time learning, learning the channel model. However, uh, even with active learning, as you saw, the, the uh, performance of um, RCSI-based localization is limited by the following problem. In the long line of sight case, there are many different uh, physical phenomena that might explain the path loss that you, that you, that you uh, observe. Uh, you know, it depends on the size of the buildings, the shape of the buildings, the position of buildings. So it's, it's a very complicated picture that the robot is trying to understand. And if you only use this very simple path loss model that I've used before, somehow you get some performance, but you, you, know, you, get, you get a certain threshold that it seems difficult to get beyond that. So what we've done is that uh, we've, we've tried to capitalize on the fact that this uh, robot can actually uh, move around itself and rotate. And the fact that it might not have a uh, omnidirectional antenna to, to measure the RCSI. What instead, if you were using an antenna that has not omnidirectional beamforming gain, uh, but something that is more, um, yeah, more directional, you could, actually, you could in that case collect additional information 
uh, that tells you in which direction you, you seem to be receiving more power and which direction you seem to be receiving less power. Somehow, if you could collect that information and use that as an input to a more advanced channel model, which is presented here, you can get much better results. So in this, in this model, it has two parts. This new model has two parts. It has the classical path loss distance-based uh, decay model. And then we complement that with a, a machine learning based model, a neural network in this case, that will try to explain the complicated relation between the received power and the angle in which the robot is making the measurement. And that, that is very, very powerful. If you can move around the robot and expose it to different angles, it gives you a lot of additional information. And this is actually shown by the, the plots I'm showing here where you see uh, the, the blue plots here co uh, co corresponds to actual measurements of RCSI. And the red is what you manage to explain with the basic path loss model. And of course, you know, with the basic path loss model, there's not much you can explain. You can only basically explain the, the classical distance-based decay, but not much more. While uh, with this hybrid machine learning-based uh, path loss model, you can get much better results, and you see a, a close connection between the estimated red points and the true measurement measurement uh, blue blue points. Uh, and this plot is actually to show the uh, the resulting performance in terms of of a, a CDF curve of the localization error. And what I thought could be also interesting is to measure the performance with and without the robot. So a classical cellular network that would try to localize uh, UEs purely based on RSSI and purely based on uh, surrounding base stations uh, would give you the, the kind of performance indicated in the purple curve. Okay. So this is localization with three base stations. Um, now you inject the robot in the network. However, you keep uh, the channel model as simple as possible no machine learning, you're going, to, you're going to get the performance obtained by the red curve. So you see some improvement, but the improvement is not as dramatic as what you get by having the robot and the machine learning driven uh, channel model, because in this case, very quickly, you can get extremely accurate uh, localization performance. Uh, this is my last slide. This was just to show an experiment. I don't know if it's going to work. An experiment. No, <laughs> that's always the problem with, with some animations. You don't seem to be able to activate it. So anyway, just to tell you that we have done an experiment on campus uh, with the kind of prototypes that, you, that are captured here in this picture. This is our campus. So we've flown the, the, the UAV around. We've hidden some ground nodes here, put them on the roof actually. And we asked the robot to localize those, uh, those ground nodes. And unfortunately, I cannot run the animation, but I can give you the, inf the information offline about the performance. So you, you would see the robot uh, actually quickly localizing the nodes. Um, just to finish, th this is also uh, taken from this experiment. This is a real life experiment on the campus. Again, this shows the, the, the power of this machine learning aided uh, channel model where as you can see, just look at the bottom curves here. On the left-hand side, this is the, the trajectory described, for example, for a UAV describing a circle around the ground node. So basically, a simple channel model would tell you that the, the path loss should be always the same, right? If you do something like that. And this is the, the, the line with, with black triangles. This is the basic channel model. But this basic channel model does not match at all the measurements, which are represented here by the blue, blue, blue points. And again, if you inject this uh, machine learning edit model, you're going to get predictions that are given by those red stars, and they are much more, much more realistic. OK, I'm going to conclude now. Uh, so the whole point of this presentation was to say that injecting a single robot in a wireless network for sensing purposes allows you to get much richer uh, set of sensing data. The additional message is that you need to use mapping somehow because mapping gives you a sense of reality of what's going on in the network. Uh, and it's very, very important to maintain reliability. You may or may not have the map initially. You can actually reconstruct the map while flying. Uh, not time to describe that, but this is definitely possible. 
And then the third one is active learning, which is really exploiting the real intelligence of the robot, which is that it can self-position itself in places where the data it's measuring is the most meaningful for the task you're trying to solve. And I have to say that uh, in a few days, I'm going to Dresden and, and presenting something where you will also see some combining of these RCSI measurements that are used together with uh, time of arrival data uh, measurements and gives you uh, additional capabilities that are going to be presenting. Okay, I stop here. Thank you very much. Sorry for extending the time. Oh, thank you, David. Very interesting. And I think uh, maybe we can handle a couple of questions that uh, we have on, on the chat. Uh, and then uh, other questions maybe later in the discussion panel. Uh, so uh, we have one question about uh, how to achieve positioning if only non line of sight link is available. I don't yeah, know this is actually. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, if I may answer that one. Yeah, 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 please, David. Um, this, is, this was my main point, is that uh, localization in non of site environment is, is really, really challenging. Whether you use RSSI, actually, or whether you use time arrival, because as you know, time arrival in non of site does not help you to pinpoint the exact location of the target. But if you inject a robot, uh, for positioning by optimizing the places at which the robot is collecting the measurements, you can get much more meaningful information. Okay, thanks to this angle based model. And the second thing is that even if initially you think you don't have uh, a lot of line of sight capabilities, the robot is actually going to help you find those opportunities by moving at places where you do trigger additional line of sight links. And this is where you're going to learn uh, much more about uh, what you're trying to estimate. Thank you, David. One more maybe. Uh, is it possible to compute the inverse of the FIM in real time, even with the large number of uh, users? Can we handle this uh, now? Okay, so, uh, so the experiment I've shown you at the end, which is a life experiment, does not have the active learning enabled. It has this advanced machine learning pathless model enabled, but not the active learning part. So I cannot answer that question for real life scenario. Uh, what you saw are simulations that are doable. I mean, it's, we didn't have to wait that much time. It is definitely uh, available. Uh, but in terms of re real time uh, implementation of that, it's, it's an interesting question and I, I'm, I'm looking forward to be discussing on that point, but I don't have a definitive answer on that. Yeah, and uh, maybe since we have also one more uh, question about the, how, uh, if you could briefly describe the main process for the simulation experiment, if this could be handled now. Uh, yeah, very quickly. So all yeah. the experiments are, are designed with uh, computerized cities that look like this. So we, we inject random buildings of random heights uh, then we, we uh, throw a number of users and then we, we do Monte Carlo averaging over arbitrary user locations. Uh, and then, then we average over the results. Um, I'm not sure, uh, maybe this was the, the main question. So this is really okay. Monte Carlo based experiment. Okay. Okay, maybe if we want more uh, details, we can handle them at the end, at the end uh, session. So thank you, David, for this interesting uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Let's uh, go to our next uh, speaker. I would like to ask uh, Wolfgang uh, Uchik to share his uh, slides. Uh, and uh, in the meanwhile, I would like just to say a few words uh, about uh, Wolfgang. Uh, Wolfgang is actually a professor at Technical University of Munich and uh, also the Dean of the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. And uh, Wolfgang is uh, an IEEE fellow, holds many patents in the field of uh, multi-antenna signal processing. And uh, he has, of course, uh, a long uh, his research history and has co-authored uh, uh, and authored many international journals and uh, conferences, more than 400 from what I know. So welcome, uh, Wolfgang, I give you the floor. 
Yeah, uh, Nancy, thank you very much. Can you can you hear me and see my slides? Yeah, everything yeah. is perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, first of all, I would like to to thank you for inviting me here to this very interesting lecture series. It's really my pleasure to be here. I had to change the title a little bit. I'm sorry for that, but I'm still, I guess, in the middle of uh, the topics of your series here. Um, I'll I'll talk about um, learning the physical lay in FTD systems, and I'll talk about machine learning. So the subtitle here is centralized learning of distributed functions. And I hope you, you will understand what I mean by this. And I, I will start with an, with an, an observation that we made and, and a finding, so to say, uh, that uh, with, with which I would like to introduce into this topic. And you may wonder uh, wh why I start with this, but hopefully you can clarify this. I, I would like to talk about, um, I, would make to make an, I would like to make a note on uplink downlink distributional invariance. What, what do I mean by this? First, of course, uplink downlink, that means uh, the two uh, in frequency duplex systems this plays an important role because we have their different frequency domains. So what is distributional invariance that relates to distributional shifts? And that is a topic in machine learning, which means basically if you have, for example, some medical MRI data, maybe from a hospital in US, and then you are training a network, and then you apply this uh, software maybe on MRIs on somewhere in, in, in Europe, then you, it might not work. Yeah? And that is a, a, a famous um, a problem that has been identified in machine learning that, of course, uh, that your, your stuff is trained on some data, and maybe uh, if you apply it to some other data, which is of the same category, but is not from the same sources, there's a problem. And that is the so-called distributional shift problem. And if this is not there, then you would have a distributional invariance. Yeah? So the distribution is the same. Also, you may have, um, you may uh, get the data from uh, another source. Yeah? And, and that is something I would talk about that this phenomena can be found in channel estimates from the uplink and the downlink. And uh, this brings me to this. This is not a theorem because I can't, cannot prove it rigorously, but it says the following. First of all, let's remind what we know about uplink, downlink, and FTD systems. The first of all is that the instantaneous channel realizations are not reciprocal. Yeah, this is clear for many reasons for the different frequency, et cetera. So, but what I will show you is that the distribution of data it is, but not of a single link, yeah? not of a single link. So I will hopefully I can clarify what I mean by this. So here is a statement. This is not a theorem. I would like I could coin that as a theorem. It's not a theorem, but it's a finding. Yeah? It's an observation, or you might say an exhibition, uh, as, uh, sampling channel state information from the same propagation environment in different frequency bands. So this is uplink downlink but still in the same propagation environment because the scatterers, et cetera, they have, do not change, represent approximately the same underlying probability distribution. Yeah? This is not a rigorous proof, but this has been, we have shown evidence to this by statistical hypothesis testing. So let me give you an intuition where this comes from, what was my intuition when I was looking for this. Think about the following situation. You have here an antenna array of N antennas, you have here just a very simple case of one impinging wavefront, and the wavelength is determined by frequency and, length, uh, and speed of light. And then you have here the distance of the antennas. In a, in a, in a very, very simple model, I, I know about the simplicity of this model. We have a steering vector or some antenna manifold vector that looks like this. And this is depending on the angle of arrival, it's depending on the distance d here and on the frequency, we know all that stuff. Yeah? And this gives this factor alpha, and then we have these uh, potentials of alpha, which gives the steering vector. So if we now change the frequency, which happens if we went to go from uplink to downlink slightly, and then we change the frequency. But then if we would have, then if we would just think as a thought experiment of a different impinging wave from with a little different angle, then it will be possible, the following situation, that also we have changed the frequency, we will find a different impinging wavefront with a different slightly changed angle such that F sine theta is equal to F plus this changed F plus sine times sine the changed angle, which means that 
this antenna we see this impinging wavefront, and this antenna we see impinge other impinging wavefront, and with two different frequencies, we'll have the same array response. We'll have the same channel vector, yeah, basically. So what does this mean? Because this is obviously not the same link. But these are two possible links in the environment. So now if we think about that, we can completely scan the whole environment by some Poisson process, maybe we get all kinds of links that are possible in such a channel environment. Then at the end, we would have many, many channel vectors, which by some enumeration function can be assigned to each other. So actually what does this mean? That the bunch of data, which is representing a distribution for the uplink is equal to the bunch of uh, or the ensemble of data points of, of, of channel vectors in the in the in the downlink or the uplink, vice versa. But this is not true for the single link, but it's true for the whole distribution. So you might say, okay, this is a very simple example. Can you prove this? Now I can't prove this, but what we did is we tried to do with some two sample tests. We tried to find out that this is really true. And a two sample test is, I have some pickup slides. If we have enough time later, I can show you. What we actually did is we have a data from the same environment. We have a, some data sets for uplink and some downlink data sets. We mix it up and uh, find new data sets. So they should be actually, if we mix it up and then divide it randomly again, then these two sets should be actually, so they have the same properties or we really compare the uplink to the downlink. And that is the other hypothesis. And then if we apply some hypothesis tests here, and here you see a histogram of many, many tests, then you see that the tests here actually are the same. Blue is for mixing up the data, red is for separating really uplink and downlink, and you see the test cannot distinguish really between this distribution. So practically this distribution are the same. There is a lot to say about that, and you might have questions later on that, but for the short of shortness of time, I have to skip here more details. But why is this important here? Why do I start a talk about physic learning physical layer functions in FTD systems with this problem? Because it may change our view on physical layer functions and how to learn them. Why is this the case? Because what really matters in machine learning is not the single element for the training, it's a distribution of the data. Oh, is this true? I think there's a little blemish. No, it's the ensemble of data. Yeah. So because we unfortunately doesn't, don't have the distributions. If we would have the distributions, machine learning would not play such a big role because then we have all the distributions we would like to have. But we don't have the distributions. We, ha we have ensembles of data and we have maybe many, many uplink data that we collected. We have many, many downlink data that we collected. And these are the ensembles. They are representing distributions. And what I, my conjecture is now, this distribution is all the same. And this is not the, this is not the reciprocity that comes by some covariance matrix properties of this. I don't talk about this. I talk about the distribution, really about the PDF. So what does this mean? It allows a new view, in my opinion, a new view on how to design FDD file layer functions. What do I mean by this? And I show this here in this slide. So the idea is as follows. We have functionalities at the mobile terminals that we want to support or that we want to have. Maybe at the mobile terminals, we have to estimate channels or we have to work with some code books. Yeah, if we have some feedback schemes, or we, we want um, to create feedback of channel state information, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah? There are more topics like this. And, and typically, as you, you see many papers where this is done in conventional techniques, so channels are estimated at the mobile terminals, and then there is some uh, algorithm, and at the end, you have a functionality, a file layer functionality. Let's say maybe how to, uh, how to uh, produce feedback that is sent back, back to the Station or a channel, a channel is estimated. Yeah. So this is done. And this is something that has to be done with the downlink data because the mobile terminal receives downlink data. So the idea is, but the idea is now as follows. What do we have? Where do we have actually have just lay back and think a minute? Where do we have the most information at all in the network? We have it at the access points, we have it at the base station. And most of this information is fading away. 
it's just used the channel state or used for the single link for the single situation and then it's wasted or it's at least or maybe maximally it's used for estimating some covariance matrix information or something like this but there is so much information about the whole environment because there are many users on the environment they all have operations they all have links and connections with the base station and all this data is there at the base station so why but the problem in fvd systems is that all this data is uplink data and this is not the data which we are used to train our functionalities at the mobiles because the mobiles have to be trained on data which is a downlink so and now kicks in the distribution invariance that i said before so my my claim is that you can learn any functionality in the file layer that the mobile terminal later on will apply on downlink data at the base station without ever using downlink data. You can do everything with uplink data. You don't need downlink data in order to train or to learn downlink data functions. That's the point of this conjecture. So we train all that stuff. For example, we train a channel estimator or later on we train a code book that makes, by the way, code books very adaptive because you can train them at the base station. Yeah? And you will see, you don't have to provide the code book to the mobile terminals. You just have to provide a function to the mobile terminals that can assign observations to code book entries. So this is the way how it works. You have all this data, more or less, maybe even for free, maybe it needs some standard changes. I don't think so. But anyway, and then you have the base station. At the base station, you train all the functionalities, whatever you want, and then this in, in a deep neural network. And then the parameters of the deep neural network, not the parameters of the channel, the parameters of the deep neural network are offloaded to the mobile terminals. So I give you an example. Channel compression and reconstruction. There have been a lot of papers by using outer encoders, machine learning here for this problem. So what we do is, the problem is as follows. What we do is we train this solely based on uplink data at the base station. Because at the base station, we have tons of uplink data of all kinds of users in the cell. So this is not learning for a single link. This is learning and creating machine learning functions for the whole net, yeah? or not for the whole net, but for the whole cell or for the whole sector, yeah? not link-based. So we, we have all this data. With this data, we play this game here. We train an outer encoder. And this outer encoder has this compression function. Yeah? So it encodes the input data to a, a latent space, which is of lower dimension. There is many things that can be said about this, but this is not the topic today. But I, can, I can compress the data on the latent space. This is then maybe a format for the feedback because it has much less dimensions. And then I also add there, because everything which is here in this pink color is at the base station. So I train also the decoder. We call this encoder and decoder in the language of our encoders. And then we map the latent space back to the reconstruction of this data. So once we have done this, we know how the encoder has to work. We know how the decoder has to work. This functionality are encoding ju encoded just by the weights of the neural network. This is not too much. Yeah? You can have very big networks. Our big network networks are not as, as large. Yeah? So what you, what you then do is you take this encoder function and you offload it to the base station. This means offloading just the weights of a neural network. This is not offloading any data about the, about the network, but in, well, about this environment. But in some sense it is because this encoder, of course, incorporates everything that you have seen at the base station from the uplink view. And as I told you, everything what you see in the uplink distribution view is also valid for the downlink view. Yeah? You don't need downlink data to understand how the distribution of data has to be mapped to a function. So we can offload this. This is here the blue color. So how does this then later work? Later, it works like this. You have a channel estimate or some observation data at the mobile terminal. You give it into this function that has been offloaded before, but trained solely based on uplink data at the base station. This is applied. You get some latent space representation. This is your CSI feedback. You, you transmit it in a feedback protocol 
to the transmitter, or the base station. The base station is aware about this because it has learned to decode it before. It, know, it doesn't have to do any retraining. It just takes this data, plugs it into the decoder, gets a reconstructed data. And the nice thing is, this works here. Everything here is downlink data. But downlink data has never been used for training this stuff. Now, does this work? Yes, it works. And that is a nice story here. Yeah? So we have here just showing here what kind of network we used. This is a convolution network, but I think this is just the technical part here. You obviously believe that we can do this. Let me talk a little bit about the simulation I'm going to show you now. This has been done with the Patrika channel simulator from the HHI. It is here a non light of sight scenario with five, 58 paths. Yeah? So, uplink downlink reciprocity for a line of sight channels is not as such an issue. Yeah? This is non line of sight. We have 58 paths. We have just roughly 50,000 channels for training. This is not so much as you might know yeah, in many applications. We have here 64 antennas at the base station. We have one antenna at the receiver. We have other experiments with MIMO, but this is MISO. We have, but here we have a white band scenario with 160 carriers. We have here compression rate about 90, factor of 90 or something like this. This is not mentioned later, but I say it here. This is a center frequency and we have a frequency gap of 120 or 480 megahertz. And what we have here is, you see here the, uh, the TRP position of the transmitter, you see here uh, the receiver positions. What he applies is, what I said before, uh, and we can also show this with some two sample tests, uh, empirically, that the distribution invariance holds here. So and here you see what happens. You see here the CDF, the cumulative distribution function of the channel estimation error after reconstruction at the base station. In a situation where you have standard techniques, which are used here, this is IDFT and some linear interpolation. This is what can be done. This is the, I would say, quite well-known CSI net. This is an idea of having an autoencoder, but the autoencoder is completely done at the mobile terminal. Yeah? And um, there are some issues, as you can see. Then you will see here the reference, you see the yellow curve. The yellow curve, if, if we just, if uplink and downlink frequency is the same. So in other words, what we can do in the simulation, we assume that the downlink data is equal to the uplink data, uh, though there is no frequency gap. So that is the best you can do. And now you see the difference, what happens if we rely on the conjecture introduced to you. So this is almost, though the blue curve is the reconstruction at the base station of data that has been fed back from the mobile terminal with a functionality that has been used at the mobile terminal, which was trained without ever having seen downlink data. But we apply it here to downlink data. You see that there is not a big problem. Okay. So this is when we apply then this data for a, a linear multi-user multi linear pre-coding yeah, at the downlink, just to see, because if we have multiple users, you have your eight users, we have here eight users, we have 64 antennas, we have eight users. We have here, this is not capacity or something like this. This is just a, a zero forcing approach. We have chosen here a zero forcing approach because zero forcing is very sensitive to errors in the direction of channels, yeah? because then you have interference. So you see, this is a standard approach. This is what we can do. And this is us just so far, so far just proof of concept. We have, of course, more advanced techniques to improve this. Yeah? This is just to show that it really works. Yeah? Okay, other example. We can do it for codebook construction. This is a, a work together with Huawei in Munich yeah, where we're working on this. We can do it for codebook construction. But the same thing at the mobile terminal, the other mobile terminals, they experience their channels. They have a contact with the base station because there is an uplink. They, the base station collects all this data, not of these few, mobile terminals which are currently on operation, but over the time, yeah, the base station has a few on the whole environment because it can just see all the mobile terminals in the past as well. Yeah? So it gets an idea of the channels, of this channel landscape, so to say, in the environment. The base station can use this and can construct code books. And these code books are not fed back to the mobile terminal because to have the story, we don't talk here about the story of adaptive code books, 
but we just have these code books, so to say, in mind at the base station. What instead what we do at the base station is we learn a classifier, a deep neural network that takes a channel observation and maps it to an entry of the code book. Because this is what we want from the mobile terminal. We do not want that the mobile terminal knows the code book. We want the mobile terminal that it can select an element of the code book that we have in mind to use it later on for the downlink. So the mobile terminal doesn't know the code book. The mobile terminal is just offloaded a function that is able to pick an element of the code book. And that means the code books are all held at the base station. And that means you have all the complexity at the base station. And that means you can have multiple code books. And that means you can have adaptive code books with not extra effort. And that means that you can at anywhere and anytime always change the code book. And that is not to be standardized. You can do this. Yeah? So, and that is also what we checked here. Again, we used the Quadriga. By the way, if you we did also other stuff with ray tracing and so on, but here I was just showing you, I'm just showing you here a Quadriga results. Again, our conjecture holds here. And what we have here now is MIMO. We have 16 four antennas, 32 or 16. We have non-line of sight or line of sight. We have different situations here. We have uh, typical kind of antennas, which they are also discussed in, in standardization. Uh, we, have, we have here 10,000 training data, 10,000. That means we, at the end, that would mean that we have observed 10,000 users during operation, yeah? or 10,000 situations that could be same user. Yeah? So that we have a view of this network. Yeah? We have an idea of how this environment can be characterized. You might even say it has a little bit of the flavor of a fingerprint technique. Yeah? But instead of having fingerprints, you have really an, a knowledge of the channels. And if we do this, like the code book itself is constructed with a quite straightforward idea with uh, some um, clustering technique. So but what I show you here is how does this work? So you see here a relative performance. The best is here at 100%, this is if you would do water filling. Yeah? You would know the perfect channel at the base station and you do for a single link water filling. Yeah? This has the potential to be capacity achieving if you have the right coding scheme. Yeah? This is this stuff. This here is the red, this is the red, and we have here this, uh, by the way, uh, this fluctuation is here not because of some errors. The fluctuation comes because we have different uses. Yeah? We have users which can achieve more or less uh, the performances, uh, the, the maximum uh, the, the, the rate. So we see here, we see here what happens is if we just blow out uniformly power because we have no channel knowledge, but we are here and everything is here between is our technique. Yeah? And, and, and what you see here is always, you see always pairs. You see here a blue pair and a green, blue and green, blue, green. Blue is where we assume that there is no frequency gap and green is where, or the other way around, doesn't matter. It anyway is the same, uh, more or less, uh, it, it, we, we have a frequency gap of 120 megahertz. Yeah? So you see actually practically no difference. And this is where we have three bits for the code book, for the whole code book of the environment. Here we have six bits, 12 bits, this, and, and then you see there's no more improvement. So we can, we can ha have here a completely adaptive code book if you want. Yeah? This was not that this was just one code book. It was learned once. Then based on this code book, we learned a classifier that is able to take a channel observation by some pilots, channel observation and map it to a code book entry. And we had only one code book. Uh, we have other, we have other, other research where we have multiple code books. This is just the potentiality I was talking about. Here we have one fixed code book, but this code book is just transport, it's just the, the mobile terminal is uh, informed about the code book just by the classifier. Okay, there's another uh, application where we do it for channel estimation. So we train at the base station how to estimate channels. And then what we offload to the, this is a CNN here, what we offload to the mobile terminal is just the capability to estimate. Yeah? And in the same way, same story, and we have here also nice results where you see here, you see here the, 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 the reference line, then you see here the blue line. This looks quite smart. Uh, this is non-line of sight. Here, even a shini omp. Shini omp means this is a an, 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 an compressive sensing technique. It's a basic one, yeah? but uh, it's a compressive sensing technique that knows the number of, uh, 
of, of, of the order, yeah, uh, the structure of the channel, which is a little bit of problem in normal line of sight. Therefore, it is, it is here failing, whereas in a line of sight scenario, uh, at least in low SNR, this is better. Yeah, but, but I don't have so much time here to go into the detail, but we can see that this also works very nicely uh, for, for this channel estimation. So, uh, prob so let me let me summarize. Uh, I, I I told you that there might be a different view on um, training and learning five layer functionalities with this finding that we have this reciprocity of distributions. Yeah, and that can be used because we don't need. This is the main message to take home. We don't need downlink data to train downlink data functionalities. Uh, we can do it with uplink data. And that, is, that means that we don't have to shuffle all the data to the mobile terminals in order or to estimate all the data there and to store it there in order uh, to, 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 have, uh, to train networks at the mobile terminals. And, and that might a little bit change the view on, on learning because uh, you should always be careful. This is my advice. You will always be careful when you read about AI applications at the mobile terminal and you should always wonder where do they get the training data? Because machine learning needs typically tons of data. So if you do machine learning at the, base, at the mobile terminals, the issue is not the complexity power, the complexity or the computational power that is needed, in my view. The problem is where does the data come from? And if you would need a heavy network traffic in order to shuffle training data to the mobile terminal, that would not be a good idea in my opinion. Yeah. So this is my take home message. Thank you very much. Uh, there are some links um, on our paper, but you find it anyway if you look for that or search it for that. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'm open for questions now. Thank you. Thank you, Wolfgang. I think we have one question, but maybe you have addressed it. Uh, maybe you just can summarize uh, a bit uh, the, uh, the points. Uh, the question is about uh, the maximum distance between frequency band for which the distribution invariance property property uh, holds. Yeah. So if you can summarize, we have, we have of course we have investigated this. Uh, that this is this is quite. Uh, we have just empirical results so far, but uh, this is up to. It depends on the carrier frequency, but for two point. Five gigahertz carrier frequency, it was doable up to 500 megahertz gaps and more. Yeah? So, sometimes, so the, the, it, the problem in principle, so from, a, from, if, if we, from a principle point of view, it, I think it's, it's, it's even, you can do even do more. But the question is, how many samples do you have? Is the data that you have acquired really fulfilling this, that you have this full, full view of the data, that it's really representing the full environment? And then the problem is, if you change the frequency so much that the overall properties of the, of the propagation change, then it doesn't work anymore. Yeah? And as well, we have also checked what happens if we apply this to a different cell. Yeah? Can, we, can we transport this into a different cell? Can we learn it, the functionality in the one sector and then apply it in the other sector? And that is always not really clear if you can do this. If it's line of sight, yes, because line of sight is not a very complicated issue. For non-line of sight, it's not so clear. That came up then by some reviewers and some colleagues I was discussing, that came up the question, oh, come on. So you can't take the functionality and cannot transfer it to as a sector? Oh, isn't that a problem? And I was saying, no, this is not a failure. This is a feature. Because machine learning, I would, I would think it's a, a, the wrong conception to believe that machine learning, you, you learn it once and then it's applicable everywhere. But if this is the case, then you cannot expect very much because then it can just perform in the average. It's a feature because you are able, and this is what Slavomir also mentioned at the beginning, what you need is you need domain knowledge. So how do you get prior information of all the channels in your sector? But this is a sector-wise domain knowledge. If you are in another sector, there are other rules. Yeah? There is another situation. So I think this is not a problem. This is really a feature. Yeah? And we should understand it like this. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. I would like to ask Albert Banks to you know, prepare the, the share screen, <laughs> the slides. So in the meanwhile, I would like to introduce Albert. Uh, Albert is a professor at the University Carlos III of Madrid and deputy director of the 
in their networks research institute, a well-known uh, institute for research, especially in mobile communications. Uh, Albert has, uh, of course, participated in many EU projects and uh, has a wide research activity uh, through publications in conferences and journal papers, especially in the fields of uh, wireless and mobile uh, networks and mobile communications. So I give you the floor, Albert. <laughs> Thank you for your speech. Okay. So thanks, thanks very much for the, the invitation. My pleasure to, to be here um, sharing, sharing this lecture with the, the other um, lecturers. So today I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence for control and orchestration of mobile networks. Um, the, uh, you know, if we look at networks nowadays, they are becoming more and, and more complex. We have a distributed infrastructure, heterogeneity, new use cases. The, the, the environment is, is becoming very tang tangled. And, and you know, we, we really need to be able to, to anticipate um, actions and, and, and to take many decisions. But if we look at, you know, how network management works nowadays, it's, it's largely human and manual. It's, it's, you know, in many cases, not, not very flexible. So, so there's, there's a strong requirements from, especially from operators towards uh, zero touch, uh, zero touch approaches and, and uh, you know, artificial intelligence is the clear, the clear enable there. So that, so it, no, that's, a, that's a bit the context of what I'm going to be talking today. I'll, I'll start with the, the framework, um, you know, that, that 3GPP is pushing uh, for data analytics and, and artificial intelligence. Um, then before going into solutions, I'll, I'll present an, a database analysis that we've performed in order to understand the, the actual benefits of having, you know, such a dynamic operation of the network. Uh, the third part of my presentation today would be present an example of you know how we can realize the benefits uh, of of orchestration. So I'll just you know present one one of the the the, the algorithms that we have been working on to to realize the the, the benefits. And the last part uh, is something that we we've started to work on recently, um, and and it is um, you know how how we can learn the 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 uh in the intention of the operator um when you know the loss function is not known the operator is not really is not really able to express um a, you know in with a function what his goal is so that's that's where we can we can somehow combine machine learning with intent based networking so let, let me start with the um a, with the framework so, so yeah, um, since artificial intelligence is clearly a natural choice for, for driving basically network uh, management and, and control. And this has been already identified by 3GPP and, and it's, you know, there, there are efforts already to, to bring uh, data analytics and artificial intelligence into the 3GPP architecture. There are basically two models uh, that 3GPP has been, has, uh, has defined to this end. One is the, the NWDAF, uh, the network data analytics function, and the other is the, the management data analytics function. So if, if we look at, you know, uh, uh, this is not really like 3GPP, it's like, you know, bringing all the pieces together, but if we look at the framework that we could have, it, it would be something like this. So on, on the one hand side here in the, in the bottom part, uh, we have the, the uh, 5G system with you know, the, the, the control and management plane uh, and the different functions that, that we have there. Uh, we have the, the management part from, from Etsy on, on the other hand. And all this is bringing information into the, the layer that could be called the, the AI-based data analytics framework, uh, which basically has these two functions I was talking about before, MDAF and NWDAF. And this, this is, you know, basically these functions are um, getting the information from all, all the, the models in the network. And then somewhere on top of that, we'll have to design the, the, the algorithms. These algorithms will take decisions and these decisions would be conveyed back to the different models of the, of the uh, 3GPP architecture. So as I was saying, 
there are basically two functions defined by 3GPP. One of them is for the control plane, that's the NWDAP. Uh, and this one is typically working at, at runtime, much faster uh, time scales than what network management and orchestration typically do. Um, some, some examples of things that you could do there are, for instance, the do, do load balancing of slices or uh, you know, take decisions regarding quality of experience or service experience. And you know, there are some 3GPP models that I'm, I'm putting down in these slides that would be responsible for that. Uh, the, the other function that we have um, uh, from, from TGPP for, for AI-based analytics is the, the, the MDAF. Um, and this one would be gathering data, collecting data, for instance, from the NFB infrastructure on computational resources or their availability. Um, also from the menu systems on the requirements and it, it can take different types of decisions, right? For instance, if we are thinking of NFBO, it would be about the placement of network functions. Uh, if we are talking about VNFM, it would be about scaling uh, resources um, a, or, or it could be also about admission control. Um, the, the, the bottom line is uh, the GPP has, has designed the, the interfaces and, and the functions, uh, but, but not the algorithm. So what, what we need to do on top of what 3GPP is actually doing is to, is to design the algorithms. And that's, that's what the rest of my talk is about. Uh, in particular, most of my talk will be focusing on scaling resources. So you know one of the use cases that we have precisely in this slide. So, before going into that, before going into, into the design of uh, algorithms to, for, for instance, scale, scale computational resources, let us analyze the, the benefits uh, of such an approach. Uh, this is a work that, that we did, um, and it's, it's largely based on, on, on real data. So what, what we have done is we have taken real data, and we have looked at uh, how beneficial it is to uh, uh, dynamically allocate resources with real data, as opposed to having you know, more static allocations. So what we want to evaluate is, is this benefit of you know, having the dynamic management at different parts of the network, from the very central part of the network to, to the radio access and even to the, the individual antennas, and understand like the impact of our time scales there. And, and our approach is generic, so it could be applied to capacity, it could be applied to, to, to computational resources, so it applies to any, any type of resource. And it's not an optimization, that we, what, that will come later with artificial intelligence. But it's rather understanding you know, the benchmark of, of um, how, how, how well we could do if we did uh, some dynamic optimization. Uh, so here, what uh, the analysis that we've done uh, comprises different levels of aggregations from what we call L equal to one, which is the antenna, to L equal to, to capital L, which would be the central part of the network. So, so we want to understand, uh, you know, at, at these different levels of, of aggregation, uh, how beneficial dynamic allocation is. Uh, the requirement that we have when we allocate resources is the, is the following. Uh, we, we divide time in windows, and we want to make sure that a certain percentage of the windows satisfy the user demands. For instance, you know, if in, in this example here, uh, what we have is uh, we take the, the traffic uh, over a week, we divide this traffic in windows of one hour, and we want to ensure that in 90% of these windows, we satisfy user demand. So if we did that, the allocation that we would require for this traffic pattern is this yellow line here. That would be the capacity that we have, which most of the times is sufficient to uh, um, uh, cope with the demand that we have, but sometimes it's exceeded by the, by the demand. Uh, how, how do we evaluate efficiency? Basically, what we do is um, uh, we have different network slices, right? Each one corresponding to different service. Um, and what we want to do is uh, allocate the resources 
required uh, for each slice over a certain time period, which is the frequency with which we can allocate resources. And what we would compare against is a, a perfect scenario where we can very dynamically reallocate resources from one slide to the other. This is what um, I'm showing in this slide. So, so in the in the left hand side, what we have is the individual slices, and the gray lines are the the amount of resources that we would require for each of these slices. And this would amount, if we look at the total amount of resources that we need in order to satisfy the demand of each slice, to this yellow line here. Uh, what we have on the right hand side is the case where we can uh, in instantly reallocate resources from one slide to the other, in, in which case, basically, we could just take the whole aggregate uh, um, as, as, as a single aggregate because the, the resources can be reallocated from one slice to the other. So in this perfectly dynamic case, the amount of resources that we would require is the, 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 this other um, yellow line here which is smaller than the previous one. That would be basically the, the gain that we have out of dynamic allocation. So if we now do this analysis for, for real traffic, that's the, I think the, 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 the big highlight of, of this part of the work. Uh, we've done it for, for two large cities with, with real traffic and different services. Um, and, and the result that we get is the, is the following. So what we have here in the x-axis, is the, the dynamic reallocation uh, frequency that we have. So uh, here we have like three months, which is basically static allocation. In the, here is when we can reallocate resources every 30 minutes. And we, what we are showing is the efficiency. Efficiency one means that, um, you know, we are at the same level of, as total dynamic allocation. Uh, efficiency zero means that, you know, that we would require infinite resources. And, the bottom line, I would not go into details and we don't have time for that, but is that, you know, there's really a high benefit from dynamic allocation. So we can go, you know, up to 80% uh, um, efficiency for 30 minutes reallocation, as opposed to static allocation that, that goes down to, to almost, um, you know, be, below 0 0.5 efficiency. So, you know, have, having seen the, really the, the benefits of, of allocation, let me, let me go into um, you know, the approach that, that we've defined in order to realize the, this. Um, we think about traditional approaches for, for demand forecasting. Basically, traditional approach for forecasting aim at minimizing the error. So they don't, they don't mind whether the error is positive or negative. I just want to be, you know, I want to predict demand as closely as possible. So that, that's the error that we would have. Sometimes we are on top, sometimes we are below. Uh, what there's no in the literature are algorithms for capacity forecasting. So it's not that I want to predict exactly the demand that I will have, it's that I want to predict the capacity that I need in order to make sure that I will be able to satisfy the demand. So that's basically what we want. We want an, an approach that makes sure that there's never negative error, meaning that we are never short of capacity, and there's as little error as possible, but always positive. That's what we call capacity forecasting. And there's there's no approach in the literature other than than our our recent work, of course. So um, that's the that's the you know the, the approach that we have designed, Dipcock. Uh, we have tried it for different types of services uh, and also different parts of the of the network, different levels of aggregation. So going very quickly into our architecture, um, what we have in as, as the input is the, the, the network traffic that we receive from the antenna. It's, it's three dimensions, right? Because the space is bi-dimensional, but we have a third dimension, uh, which is time. Uh, and this is what we put into the neural network. The neural network that we are using here is one that we are leveraging from video processing uh, actually, um, resulting from the observation that if, if we look at how traffic evolves in the region over time, that could be viewed as a video, right? So, so that's, that's why we are leveraging these um, architectures from, from video processing. Um, and then we have the output, 
uh, we have some loss function that that uh, provides the error, and that's what we are feeding back for 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 training. Uh, very very important issue here is how we design the the loss function. Because before I was saying that you know we wanted to do capacity allocation, meaning that we want to make sure that the capacity we allocate is, is always sufficient to accommodate resources. We, we never want the error to be negative, meaning that we don't have enough resources to accommodate the demand. And that's what needs to be reflected in the, in the loss function. So the particular loss function that um, we have designed here has two components. Uh, first one is what we have here, which is what we call the SLA violation. So if we ever have a smaller capacity than the demand, uh, that has a very high cost, the SLA violation, which depends on a parameter beta, which is typically very large because that's what we want to avoid. We, we want to avoid violating the, the SLA. So whenever we violate the SLA, we provide our customers with fewer resources than his demand. Uh, we are going to have a very high cost. Uh, the other part of the, of the loss function, it's the over-provisioning. When I allocate more resources than what the demand requires. In this case, we have a linear function because the cost is basically proportional to the extra capacity that we have allocated and it's not needed. And here again, like, you know, the, the, the slope of, of this function will depend on a parameter, which is, which is gamma. So by, by having this, by defining these loss functions, we can ensure our objective was uh, capacity provisioning that I was mentioning before. Uh, there's this unique parameter, which basically defines how much we, we want to avoid SLA violations. Uh, so yeah, this is the neural network that, that we have used. That's what I was saying before that we've leveraged it from, from video processing. Um, and let me, let me just give some um, uh, some examples of results that we've, we've obtained, just summarizing very much uh, because of time. So this is, we are doing this analysis with, with real traffic. Um, uh, this is, the, this is the, the city that we have from, from which we have the traffic, uh, different services, as I was saying, um, different parts of the network. And I will not go into details, but basically, the algorithm works. So, so if we compare to state of the art, uh, the, the gains are really very high. Of course, the state of the art is not about capacity provisioning. So, so uh, it's somehow unfair to compare to, to those approaches. But the point is that you know our, our approach is the, is the first one on, on really capacity provisioning. So, so there's no state of the art to compare with, which is pursuing exactly this, this approach. Um, a few minutes, I'd, I'd like to, to talk about what, what we are doing right now. Uh, the, the main problem when, when we go with, with such an approach to, to operators is that in many cases, they don't know the, the loss function that they want to optimize. So, you know, if you go to, to an operator and that's, that's, that's aligned with um, intent-based networking, right? The operator will say things like, I want to maximize the revenue that I have. But you know, if I allocate to this function or to this user X resources, I don't know whether this is maximizing my revenue. I will know, you know, at the end of the month, once the user pays me, uh, and once I compute the costs of allocating resources, what the what the revenue is. But uh, at at the time of taking a decision, uh, uh, I, I don't know whether a certain capacity would be satisfactory for a user or not. Think, for instance, of quality of experience. Uh, I'm allocating, you have a video and I'm allocating a certain capacity to you. That, does this maximize your quality of experience? As an operator, I don't know until I ask the user and the user tells me about the minion, minion opinion square, I will not know uh, the loss function. So the, the, my point is that in, in many real situations, the loss function is not no. I can only determine a posteriori whether 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 experience is good or not. So the the approach we are taking to this end is is the following. So I I don't have just a predictor as I used to have, but I need the second block, which is the loss learning block, which is learning the loss function. I don't know the loss function. I need to learn it. 
So then I need to concatenate uh, um, two neural networks, one for the prediction itself and one to learn the, the objective of the operator. Uh, and that's, that's what we have here. That's the architecture. Uh, it gets more complicated than the, the time I have to go into it uh, because we need, for instance, to add noise in order to have a, a, the exploration of, um, of the loss functions. Otherwise, we will not be exploring all the possibilities for the loss function. So it gets a bit more complex. But bottom line is that we have two different neural networks, one which is doing the prediction and one, one that is learning the objective of the operator. Uh, we've tried it out for, for you know, this particular case, use case. In this particular use case, the operator basically says, I want to maximize revenue. And the revenue depends on the satisfaction of the user, which depends on the quality of experience, for which we have revolved to, to some empirical models, which a priori are not known by the operator, and the capacity cost. And, and I will not go into further details, but the, the bottom line is that it works. So, you know, with, with this architecture composed of two different neural networks, we, we are able to really learn uh, the objective of the operator, even if, if it's no known a priori. So just to, just to close um, with the takeaway messages of my talk, um, 3GPP has already identified the need for artificial intelligence. I think that it's, it's widely agreed upon the community, the research, but also the, the, the industrial community that artificial intelligence is going to be in the core of uh, mobile networks, yet uh, algorithms are still to, to be designed. Uh, we've performed some data-driven analysis that shows that uh, you know, artificial intelligence can really provide very, very important gains. Um, and, and we have done some, some work on artificial intelligence algorithms itself, focusing on capacity provisioning uh, as opposed to a state of the art. Uh, and my last point is that, you know, in many cases, loss functions are not known a priori and we have to learn them, uh, which I claim is a fundamental component for intent-based networking. So um, with this, I, I close my talk. Uh, uh, thank, you, thank you very much for, you, for your attention and, and also for, for inviting me again to, to this event. Thank you, thank you, Albert. Thank you all for your very interesting presentations. And I would like also to thank our audience. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite encouraging that we had so much, so many people uh, listening to, to this first uh, series of lectures. Um, I would like probably to just share my screen so that uh, we go to a very short uh, Q&A session since uh, we don't have so much time left. So, uh, one moment. Okay, maybe now you can see my screen. So, probably only one uh, question to cover. Uh, no. Okay, I think I'm back. <laughs> okay, I think I'm back now. Okay. So maybe we can uh, discuss about one uh, potential question. Uh, about the, the three most impacting uh, research areas uh, for, uh, uh, for, for 6G? Yeah, I can, I can say something because I guess Slavomir already posted it into the chat. Yeah. Um, so just just a, a comment before. I, I'm always a little bit uh, 
surprised about this question because I, I, I guess this is a question that the guys from industry can much better answer. So I'm an academic and I have the privilege to be curiosity driven. So I try to study interesting stuff yeah? and, and that is a freedom I enjoy. But nevertheless, of course, you should get an answer because I, I'm also thinking about this, of course. And but but I, I, with this this little little beginning of my 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 answer, I just want to say that this is I, I don't know how much this means when I say this. So, but the first one is uh, I think um, we also mentioned it. I, I I find that we will need higher frequencies in six G, and this is terahertz. And I guess that they are really challenging for the devices and the physics. This is something I, I guess is really a, a challenge because that brings now uh, RF and, and physics and so on much more again in the middle of, of the problems. So this is for me something. Uh, another one is uh, also mentioned by Slavomir I saw is that I wonder, we see so much now these days about um, localization and, and, and communication and there are many, many promises. And I, I wonder uh, how these uh, proof of concepts can uh, get into technical solutions. So this, I guess, is, is really, uh, in my opinion, but others might have better uh, views on that. But I, I'm really curious to see how this really gets into technical solutions. And, and the last one is uh, where, where I, what I already addressed a little bit with my talk is when we talk about AI, because we think AI plays a major role in 6G. And then once more again, I, I would like that we think more about where the data comes from. So how do we, how do we train functionalities with which data? Because typically we see networks with, which are extremely data hungry, with many, many layers. Yeah? So they need really hundreds, thousands, millions of data. And I really wonder where does this data come from? Can we generate it artificially and then do it somewhere? Can we do it in the backbone and then offload data? Or have we do this on the mobile terminals? I'm a little bit skeptical sometimes what I can see in some proof of concept papers. And so these are my, my views. But actually, I guess this is something that guys from industry can tell us and may ask us how we can help them. This is my view, thank you. Thank you, Wolfgang. Uh, I don't know if there, uh, any other of the speakers could, could complement the, the answer. So maybe um, I will say something. Um, okay, so um, I, I wrote, you know, um, from my perspective, the most, uh, say, interesting research topic in, in the context of 6G. But uh, this session is about AI, and uh, <clears throat> um, I mentioned some some challenges in my talk. So, um, and uh, I was talking about this APS, and this is in fact as a strongly related to what Wolfgang was talking about. <laughs> and um, yeah, I have a little bit different opinion than him, and also different experience, because. Um, our experience is that we evaluated a machine learning algorithm with Quadriga and they worked perfectly. And then uh, we took data, measurement data, and then the algorithm didn't work at all. <clears throat> so what we found out is that our machine learning algorithm learned Quadriga. <laughs> I mean, they learned how Quadriga works. and. Uh, so I think that, you know, we have to be very careful. Um, you know, we are talking about deeply integrated AI and we have to cope with a highly dynamic environment. So we are, we are talking about environment where the channel distribution changes every 10, 40 milliseconds. So it's a uh, changes every, all the time. And in fact, you know, maybe you don't have time to, to uh, collect enough uh, training data to, to train, I mean, let alone to train neural networks or things like this. So I think that here, this is exciting research area and, uh, and definitely, you know, uh, we need here maybe, you know, even new approaches to this, uh, to this problem, right? I mean, domain knowledge I mentioned uh, things like this, and um, and on top you need some kind of distributed machine learning. So I think that uh, you know this is maybe what I would like to add to uh, to uh, uh, in addition to what I wrote in the chat. Thank you, thank you, Slavomir. Uh, I, I see Wolfgang wants to. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> if I can answer to that, yeah. this is very interesting. Yeah. What Slavomir says, 
I, I find it very noticeable to, to, to have here a guy from HHI who tells me that Quadrica uh, is not reliable. Um, uh, I, I fully agree with you, Slavomir. I fully agree with you. We should be very, very careful if we base our uh, results uh, on, on, on just on, on simulation. There. Because what you say that we all learn our technique on the simulator, uh, this, is a, this is a problem where we have anywhere, uh, in any, any science where we do simulations instead of having... So this is absolutely true. Therefore, we do not rely anymore on Quadriga. Actually, we have to rely now on this is also just as maybe better, but also a problem in a workaround is with this ray tracing. Ray tracing, I would say, is more reliable. Depends on the ray tracing tool, of course. And um, yeah, but you are completely right. I would love, I would love to demonstrate what I told you uh, uh, with measurement data, but I'm not available to have enough of this. We have some measurement campaigns and there it was nice, but this is not representable. And the other thing, what you said, there is not enough data for training and then time, enough, time enough for training. I fully agree again. Yeah? There is not enough time for training. Uh, this is actually what I said. Yeah? I, I really am concerned about this. If I see fancy algorithms that need a lot of data in a time frame that we don't have. Yeah? But by the way, this was not what I'm talking about. So actually I was saying, collect all the data in the network that you get over the time, over the history of operations, maybe over days, yeah, hours, days, and then learn about the environment because the environment uh, does, uh, does not, the, the, the scatterers, they do not change. Yeah. But I fully agree with you. Yeah. Maybe short statement for me. I, I didn't say that Quadriga is not reliable. Quadriga wasn't developed for uh, testing uh, machine learning algorithms. So this, this is, you know, I think it's important to emphasize, yeah. <laughs> it was developed for other yeah. purposes, yeah. Uh, maybe we can ask also Albert because I think one yeah, of the yeah, topics so that Albert was uh, talking about uh, is is highly influenced by this AI approach. And also maybe Albert, you can combine uh, some answer to, to the question we have about your presentation about the public non-public networks. Uh, some some comment, I don't know <laughs> if you can. Yes, um, so, so yeah, I think, uh, so for artificial intelligence and 6G, so, so first I think that our artificial intelligence has been able, to, has proved already that it can, it can uh, improve you know, performance of all typical network operations. Uh, we've been trying it to, to, to research the location, uh, to network slicing, and you know, my colleagues have, have presented uh, other applications. So, so I think that artificial intelligence will probably make it into into all layers uh, of the protocol stack and, and improve the performance that, that may be seen a bit more like kind of incremental, right? Like it's, it's, it's yet another approach providing further, further improvement. Where I see something a bit more disruptive is what, what I was saying in my, my last part of the presentation. So to, to learn about user satisfaction and about operator satisfaction. So, so as, as we want to provide interfaces that, that are uh, um, easier, easier for for the, the, the customers. Uh, uh, we will not be able to 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 know their level of satisfaction about uh, unless we learn it. So this is where I see that that artificial intelligence can also uh, help us getting their feedback and feeding this and learning from their feedback and feeding this into the network function. So the, this this I I say. Um, exciting uh, research line that that we've we've started recently we just published an earlier paper at uh, last last infocom but we are just you know pretty much starting with this uh regarding the question of of public and and non-public uh, i i think the approach applies equally to to both so 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 regardless whether it's public or not um you know which we, sh we should be able to apply apply this approach to learn about the customer, regardless whether it's you know private entity or it's a public network operator. Thank you, Albert. David, would you like to conclude? Uh, conclude, I don't know, but uh, let me add a few, a few more comments <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and try to take a different direction. Uh, th there's a lot of different topics that are of a high interest for, for 6G, both scientific and, and practical ones. But when it comes to AI, uh, there's something that is uh, high on the agenda here, at least at, at your recommend. This is something for which we have an ongoing project with our uh, Huawei partners, Huawei Paris Labs, 
is which is um, you know how to how to turn networks as green as possible and how to reduce the footprint in terms of energy consumption, and what is the role that AI can play to that extent? Uh, we we know we know the footprint of AI in terms of the energy that it requires to train large models is is very uh, negative. It has has a very negative impact. Uh, it has the training of big models have been compared to the energy that it takes to produce and use several cars over the entire lifetime of cars. You can imagine how much energy that is. But on the other side, we know, and we have seen from the presentations today that there's a potential for AI to be used to optimize the, the network operations, uh, functions of the network that currently probably occupy or, or consume too much resources and energy. So there's definitely a potential that is more positive there. I would be very interested to have a complete uh, picture that looks at the pros and the cons and does the, the final balancing for AI as a hopefully as a, as a help towards green networks. Uh, that's the first point. Second point is uh, another very interesting aspect that I've seen in the evolution from 4G to 6 to 5G and to more 6G is that I, I remember that when people were talking about 4G initially, it was all about uh, centralization of networks and using the, the cloud to centralize most of the network optimization network functions. And 5G still remain like that. And I think people have realized that some, some applications that were envisioned for 5G that were requiring very, very fast response time are just not feasible with the current release of 5G. Uh, it's very hard to uh, do accurate um, driving of remote cars or, or robots uh, and do reliable control of actuators and, and robots uh, with 5G, with, with the current latency performance that, that we have. So people have realized that there's probably a need to, to push some of the uh, control and decision-making more towards the edge of the network. And this, that, that is very different from the, uh, the, the previous thinking in 4G and also initially in 5G. So to me, there's a very interesting underlying question here, which is, where, where is it that you should be allocating intelligence and control and decision-making algorithms? It, it's clear that as a function of the latency that certain applications can tolerate, the intelligence can be put more into the core network and sometimes can be put more into the, the edge of the network. As you push it towards the edge, uh, yes, the latency is being reduced, but you've, you're facing other challenges. You, you're facing the problem that uh, devices at the edge of the network uh, will use local data, which can be obtained with, with uh, very low latency, but it will be much harder to uh, centrally coordinate all these devices uh, and to make them cooperate. So th there's, a, there's a very interesting problem of, I would say, decentralized decision-making um, optimization for, for such uh, networks for which um, data and control remains mostly at the edge. And it touches a lot on, on, on fundamental uh, control problems and signal processing of, of interest. So this is the, the main remark I wanted to make. Yeah, thank you, David. Very interesting uh, as well. Uh, so I think uh, we have used all of our time allocated for this session. I would like to thank all of you participating and providing presentations in this uh, session. I think it was uh, quite interesting, quite challenging. One uh, G is uh, trying actually to establish uh, this um, uh, series of lectures, uh, as you may see here, as a main platform which could be helpful for researchers and students to learn and discuss uh, and uh, exchange ideas about the 6G relevant topics. We hope to see everybody uh, again in our next uh, series of lectures. And uh, thank you all again for your time and your participation. Uh, have a nice afternoon and you can find all the material uh, in 16 uh, and uh, where you can also have access to the 16 position paper. Thank you all. And uh, have a nice afternoon.